Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my great honor and, and pleasure uh, to welcome to our program Dr. Tong Zhao, uh, who is a senior fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a visiting research scholar at uh, the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University. He is an associate editor of the journal Science and Global Security and is a member of the International Panel on Fissile Materials. He serves on the board of directors of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament and on the advisory board of the Missile Dialogue Initiative. With a research focus on nuclear weapons policy, uh, deterrence and uh, arms control, nonproliferation, missile defense, hypersonic weapons, and China's security and foreign policy, Dr. Zhao is the author of Tides of Change, China's Nuclear Ballistic Missile Submarines and Strategic Stability in Narrowing the U.S.-China Gap on Missile Defense, How to Help Forestall a Nuclear Arms Race. We're all very grateful, um, Dr. Zhao, for your participation in our program, especially at such a busy and I think for our topic, a uh, very relevant time. Um, now, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to see everyone here. Um, I'm happy to talk about um, China's uh, nuclear policy, how it has changed, especially in recent years and why it is changing, as well as its implications for uh, China's you know, uh, nuclear relationship with the United States, um, and how and, and whether and how we can perhaps um, start uh, some arms control discussions to contain an escalating uh, nuclear rivalry between the two countries. Um, <clears throat> as <clears throat> Many of you probably already know that China traditionally has a very self-restrained uh, nuclear capability and nuclear posture uh, because the Chinese government never revealed uh, any uh, information about its nuclear weapons uh, program. According to open source research uh, conducted by uh, foreign experts, uh, which is uh, widely used in the research community, for decades, China maintained a very small nuclear arsenal of about 200 nuclear weapons in total. Um, and that's certainly much smaller compared with even today's American or Russian nuclear arsenal, which you know uh, are about 4,000 active nuclear warheads. Um, and China reportedly uh, kept uh, its nuclear uh, Forces at a relatively low alert level during peacetime, uh, which is different from the uh, so-called launch under uh, attack or launch on warning postures of the United States and uh, Russia. Um, and reportedly, China even kept its warheads separate from the missiles during peacetime and even stored the warheads in a separate location from the missiles. So all those measures uh, were widely regarded as uh, making a positive uh, contribution to a stable uh, nuclear relationship with China's nuclear rivals and contributed to uh, uh, you know, uh, a more uh, peaceful and stable nuclear order uh, internationally. Uh, but apparently, this uh, traditional nuclear uh, strategy uh, is changing. Uh, in recent years, there is growing evidence that China is rapidly expanding its nuclear capability. The most uh, recently revealed uh, evidence is the construction of uh, more than 300 uh, silos for potential deployment of long range uh, of intercontinental range ballistic missiles or ICBMs. Um, and if you consider the fact that the newest uh, version of China's ICBMs can carry multiple warheads on each missile, uh, then the 300 ICBMs can add to, you know, can add, you know, uh, you know, perhaps. Uh, around 1,000 uh, of new warheads to China's existing arsenal. Uh, and China's nuclear uh, stockpile has already been growing uh, since a few uh, years ago. The today's number, according to the open source research, is about 350. So compared with the traditional number of 200, that's already a considerable increase. 
And then according to American uh, Defense Department and Intelligence Community's assessment made last year, uh, China is likely to have um, uh, up to 700 nuclear weapons by 2027 and will have at least 1,000 nuclear weapons by 2030, by the end of this decade. So again, the, the Chinese arsenal is apparently growing at an unprecedented um, pace uh, and scale. Uh, so what is uh, driving uh, this uh, nuclear expansion? Uh, traditionally, um, you know, uh, International experts focus on the technical uh, factors uh, underlying China's nuclear modernization program. Uh, they pointed out that uh, for a long time, China is worried about uh, Americans' pursuit of uh, nuclear primacy, meaning that China is suspicious that the U.S. may have an interest in acquiring a capability to uh, comprehensively disarm uh, China and disable China from uh, being able to launch a nuclear retaliation after absorbing a nuclear attack. Um, and the U.S. has been uh, advancing its uh, uh, non-nuclear uh, military technologies, uh, which contribute uh, to uh, a greater American capacity to uh, neutralize China's nuclear deterrent. And those non-nuclear technologies include missile defense, conventional precision strike weapons, uh, advanced uh, sensors in outer space that can help identify and uh, track uh, the movement of Chinese uh, land mobile uh, missile vehicles uh, or you know, autonomous weapon systems, uh, including autonomous uh, underwater vehicles that could help detect and track and trail Chinese nuclear submarines in the ocean. Uh, even cyber technologies uh, can be made to uh, in, uh, in, you know, uh, infiltrate uh, the other's uh, nuclear command control system and perhaps uh, disable the other side's uh, capacity to uh, launch their nuclear weapons when necessary. So this whole range of non-nuclear technologies um, uh, you know, in theory, uh, could undermine China's nuclear deterrent. And missile defense is the most important one of them, uh, because for a long time, that appears to be uh, the greatest external driver of China's nuclear modernization efforts. China has this very deep concern, you know, as well as Russia, that uh, the U.S. could attempt a comprehensive, pre uh, 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 a preemptive strike on Chinese nuclear arsenal. And in that case, only a small number of Chinese nuclear weapons may survive. And when China tried to launch a nuclear retaliation using that small number of surviving nuclear warheads, the U.S. could use missile defense to intercept them and therefore totally neutralize Chinese deterrent capability. Um, and, um, and in recent years, in addition to the uh, ground-based MECOS missile defense system the U.S. is deploying in Alaska and California, uh, there is this new interest uh, in the U.S. military to use uh, theater missile defense systems like the SM-3 uh, EG system uh, to provide an under layer to the existing American homeland missile defense. Um, so all of these new developments make China worry uh, that eventually American missile defense may be able to uh, neutralize Chinese nuclear deterrence. Uh, and of course, the demise of the INF Treaty in 2019 uh, further uh, worsens uh, Chinese concern uh, that uh, in the future, the U.S. will have the option of developing and deploying uh, land-based uh, theater range conventional or nuclear missiles uh, near China uh, on the territory of Guam or American allies in East Asia. And those uh, theater range land-based missiles could pose an additional uh, preemptive strike capability against Chinese nuclear weapons. Um, so of course, all these technological developments uh, serve as a real uh, concern. And the question is, can US and China 
maintain a stable nuclear relationship uh, facing all these new technological developments? How do we uh, address the impact of these new technologies? That's a real question. Uh, and we don't think, you know, I don't think we have an answer today. Um, so the impact of technology uh, is real and is uh, threatening a nuclear balance between Washington and Beijing. Uh, however, uh, I don't think uh, these uh, technical factors uh, are the main uh, drivers uh, behind uh, today's uh, Chinese nuclear expansion. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, yes, China has been worried about American missile defense and other non-nuclear technologies for decades. But if you look at the market side of, of the equation, there is no uh, abrupt or significant uh, increase of capability or posture, uh, including nuclear missile defense, uh, et cetera. Uh, whereas on the other side of the equation, you have China suddenly uh, making an abrupt effort to expand its nuclear arsenal uh, in a massive uh, scale. Uh, so you cannot explain the asymmetry uh, between the two sides. And then, um, we have the uh, situation that China is investing a lot into the construction of ICBM silos in northwestern part of the country, but silo-based ICBMs are not ideal uh, for addressing uh, missile defense concern, which is the primary Chinese concern. Um, it is not the most cost-effective way if the main Chinese concern is, is American missile defense. Um, so that also doesn't really explain the Chinese um, effort. And then you have you know, clear evidence that uh, many Chinese nuclear policy experts, including those in the military, are not aware, were not aware of Chinese nuclear buildup until uh, they were revealed by foreign uh, governments and foreign experts. Uh, and even after, uh, that uh, uh, was revealed even after uh, it was brought uh, to the world's attention that China has been expanding its nuclear arsenal. Even today, uh, Chinese uh, nuclear policy experts, uh, many of them still do not appear to understand uh, the rationale uh, behind this uh, important uh, expansion. Uh, they still uh, you know, cannot reconcile China's traditional nuclear thinking and policy with today's uh, apparent uh, buildup. So even today, many of them don't know why China is doing this and, and how this makes sense uh, at the military level. Um, and lastly, uh, when the news first broke out about China's ICBM silo construction, uh, uh, senior Chinese officials and diplomats, uh, they did not refer to American missile defense or American nuclear capabilities as a reason for this buildup. Uh, they talked about the uh, need for China to increase nuclear safety or security. Um, so that also doesn't really make sense. Uh, because if your goal is increasing safety and security, why do you need a, a bigger arsenal? And also, if the Chinese concern is really about American missile defense, China should not be shy, right? There's no reason for China to be shy to point the finger at U.S. missile defense and nuclear development as the reason that China needs to now expand its nuclear arsenal. And the fact that China doesn't want to make that linkage uh, officially, I think, uh, indicates that, uh, that uh, missile defense and other uh, American capabilities uh, are not the entire story. Um, so instead, I think uh, the current Chinese nuclear buildup is more driven by political level drivers. Uh, and this has to, a lot to do with the fact that China appears to be attaching greater political value to its nuclear program. Um, we know that uh, previous Chinese leaders also uh, uh, saw uh, Chinese nuclear forces as very important uh, for uh, demonstrating uh, China's national uh, power and uh, technological competency. Um, but after the current Chinese paramount leader, Mr. Xi, came into power in 2012, he apparently 
uh, is a very strong believer in the political value of nuclear weapons. So he has uh, talked openly uh, that uh, uh, China's uh, missile forces uh, constitute a strategic pillar of China's great power status. Under his watch, he upgraded uh, China's uh, missile forces, which were previously uh, uh, named as the second artillery, to uh, uh, to be renamed as a PLE rocket force, and he upgraded uh, the missile force from a military branch uh, to a full military service uh, on par with the army, the uh, navy, and, and air force. Um, and he, uh, you know, when he went to inspect uh, the rocket force bases, he told the military officials to expedite. Uh, the process of China's nuclear modernization when he inspected a naval base in 2018. He also told the officials there that China needs to massively uh, develop uh, its sea-based nuclear deterrent capability. And in uh, 2021, during one of the most important political uh, conferences in China, the so-called two sessions, uh, Mr. Xi again uh, uh, said that China needs to accelerate the construction of high-level uh, strategic deterrent uh, system. And this year, uh, uh, during uh, uh, the Chinese Party Congress, uh, the official uh, language became that China needs to build a powerful uh, strategic deterrent uh, system. If you uh, compare that with the previous Chinese uh, policy, which is to develop a lean and effective nuclear force, a lean and effective, meaning that it, 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 it needs only a small sized nuclear arsenal as long as it is effective. But today the narrative is China needs a powerful uh, strategic deterrence uh, system. So there is uh, you know, some very important uh, change uh, even at the declaratory policy level. Why this is happening? I think this is because how the Chinese leaders, especially Mr. Xi, uh, uh, looks at and interprets uh, international geopolitical change. Uh, he uh, apparently understands there are growing tensions and growing problems between China and the US-led Western countries. Uh, but he doesn't attribute the problems to uh, you know, uh, China's own behavior or China's own uh, policy. Uh, but he attributes all the problems to the structural change in international relations. In other words, he believes, uh, he appears to believe that uh, all these troubles are the result of the power transition process between China and the West uh, and the US led Western countries. Uh, previously, you know, there is a major power gap between China and uh, Western countries. So, you know, they didn't really worry about China. But when uh, China was uh, uh, my, you know China was able to further close the power gap when China was uh, you know much closer to catching up with the United States. That's when the U.S. and Western countries become more and more worried about China's capacity to challenge their predominance in the international system, and therefore the U.S. and Western countries are increasingly are become increasingly desperate to use uh, more and more extreme measures uh, to uh, you know, create problems for China, to demonize China, to uh, you know, uh, contain or even destabilize China in order to achieve the, uh, the real uh, but very selfish uh, goal of protecting uh, the US and West's predominance and to maintain their geopolitical interests, right? That's how the current Chinese uh, political leadership understands the drivers of uh, geopolitical tensions uh, between the two sides. They don't think it has anything to do with China's own behavior. They attribute solely uh, to the structural change, to the power transition uh, process. Um, and therefore, uh, they don't think it's, you know, it's that useful to really try to uh, persuade and talk and, and reason uh, with the U.S. Uh, and, and Western countries because they are knowingly, from the Chinese perspective, those countries are knowingly uh, making up this information in order to demonize China and, and, and create trouble uh, for China. 
Uh, rather, uh, from their perspective, the only way to resolve the tensions is for China to further accelerate the power transition process. By the time China can build and demonstrate uh, a formidable power, for, uh, you know, very strong national comprehensive power, uh, very strong military power, and including a very strong nuclear power, that's when the Western countries would eventually acknowledge and accept a reason China, uh, accept the reality uh, that China has already achieved uh, equal capacity uh, and has already risen. Um, and they would that's when they would eventually deal with China with equality and with uh, respect. So I think that's this this power centric mindset uh, is uh, how uh, in you know is is uh, how Chinese leadership today understands uh, the current international geopolitical development, uh, and as a result, uh, they think it is time to build up China's comprehensive national power, including uh, military power and particularly nuclear power to demonstrate China's uh, power to the Western countries. And they believe that will help contain and deter Western countries from adopting more aggressive physical policies uh, towards China. Um, and uh, particularly nuclear weapons uh, are you know, the most uh, important strategic uh, military uh, capabilities. So they will have the greatest psychological impact on the Western countries. Uh, the fact that China has been uh, prioritizing the construction of silo-based ICBMs, I think is partly because that's the uh, quickest way uh, to expand Chinese nuclear arsenal in the shortest time compared with the building of road mobile ICBMs or nuclear submarines. Uh, because of China's unique advantage in constructing a large scale uh, infrastructure projects, silo-based ICBMs can give China a much larger nuclear arsenal in a very short time. And China is, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, China wants to demonstrate a, a greater nuclear capability uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, you know, that's, uh, and I think we should pay attention to the political uh, driver uh, behind the current Chinese uh, development. And it is true that I think uh, the Chinese current nuclear buildup is driven by a self-perceived defensive objective, right? China believes that it's the US and Western countries driven by the power transition pressure uh, 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 ramping up their uh, 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 hostility against China, and therefore China needs to demonstrate str stronger nuclear power to, to deter and contain that. So China self-perceive to have a defensive objective. Uh, however, um, I think uh, when China, uh, you know, possesses a much larger nuclear arsenal, say in a few years in 2030, for example, uh, if China indeed uh, has 1,000 nuclear weapons by that time, I don't think uh, uh, China's uh, relationship with Western countries would uh, improve as a result. It will very likely lead to the opposite outcome because Western countries, they as they watch China build up its nuclear uh, arsenals and provides no explanation at all about why China is doing so. And it's certainly not imposing uh, any uh, uh, cap. Uh, China is not, you know, uh, talking about uh, how many eventually uh, China wants to have. So this appears an open-ended uh, nuclear buildup uh, in China. And this will only uh, exacerbate uh, existing threat perceptions in uh, Western countries and indeed in the in rest of the international community. So I think that will further worsen the security relationship between the two sides rather than stabilize that relationship. Uh, but when the Chinese leaders, uh, they see a worsened security relationship by that time, it is very unlikely that they will reflect on their previous decision and uh, say that, well, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have a buildup of our nuclear forces. Instead, 
I think it's very likely that they will draw a different conclusion. They will say, well, it looks like we haven't had enough nuclear weapons, right? If we have even more, the Western countries would eventually uh, calm down and, and try to, you know, uh, 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 become reasonable, right? So we need even more nuclear weapons. Uh, so I think even though at this moment, uh, uh, the China, I don't think China has an ambition to achieve nuclear parity with the U.S. Uh, and China's intention, the Plato intention is, you know, uh, self-defensive. But I think eventually this is likely to lead to an open-ended nuclear arms race between the two sides. Um, uh, something like the Cold War style uh, nuclear arms race between US and Soviet Union. Uh, and Taiwan, of course, uh, is an important uh, factor too. Um, because if you look at China's nuclear strategy, uh, traditionally China believed it only needs uh, this uh, small arsenal uh, as long as China can launch a comprehensive nuclear retaliation against U.S. homeland, that would be uh, sufficient to deter uh, American nuclear attack. That is true only in the case of a massive nuclear attack, right? It only makes sense if the U.S. launches a massive nuclear attack against China, then China would launch all its nuclear weapons against the U.S. homeland. That doesn't deter a limited nuclear attack or a limited nuclear threat. If the U.S. only uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, launches one or two nuclear uh, weapons uh, or even perhaps low yield nuclear warheads against some you know, isolated military facilities on the periphery of Chinese uh, territory, uh, you know, that, made, that made some uh, military impact uh, but didn't kill uh, many civilians, uh, would it make sense for China to then immediately retaliate with all its nuclear weapons against the homeland of the United States? Uh, because uh, uh, you know, for a long time, China didn't have the capacity uh, to uh, uh, launch uh, nuclear weapons against, uh, uh, in, because their nuclear uh, missiles were not accurate enough to be used against uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, military targets or military facilities um, at the regional uh, level. So the Chinese nuclear deterrent was solely based on the capacity to launch a comprehensive retaliation against US homeland. But that capacity, again, doesn't deter a limited nuclear attack. It would make China very hard to, to actually retaliate if uh, the US launches a limited uh, nuclear strike. Uh, that problem was already recognized by uh, Chinese military strategists as early as the 1980s. Uh, however, at that time, China-U.S. relationship was at the best of their times. Uh, China-Soviet relationship was also improving. So China didn't really invest a lot of resources into correcting that problem. Uh, but today is different. Uh, today, because of the rising concerns about a uh, conflict over Taiwan, that again uh, renewed Chinese concern about uh, American limited nuclear attack or nuclear threat. Uh, and this has something to do with China's own uh, conventional military capabilities because China has been advancing its conventional military capabilities at a very uh, impressive uh, pace. And China is uh, quickly narrowing the conventional military gap at the Asia-Pacific theater, at the regional level, especially within the first island chain with the United States. Of course, at the global level, the U.S. is still uh, much more powerful at the conventional uh, military level. But at the theater in, in, in this region, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, China is already uh, catching up with the United States uh, in terms of its conventional military capabilities. In some areas, China is already exceeding the United States. Uh, so that doesn't that means China has even less interest to uh, threaten nuclear use in a conventional war over Taiwan because of China's growing conventional capability. But that also means the U.S 
that has greater uh, interest in uh, resorting to nuclear escalation uh, because the U.S. is losing its conventional superiority. Uh, that's not the mainstream American thinking. Uh, however, a number of American scholars have made that point that in the future, uh, maybe U.S. would, you know, uh, uh, would need uh, to consider uh, threaten, threatening nuclear use first uh, in case it loses uh, at the conventional level. Um, but that's, you know, uh, a comment by a small number of American scholars, uh, you know, has made Chinese uh, experts very uh, concerned. Uh, so I think that makes China worry that it needs a more flexible and a more diversified nuclear arsenal in order to have some capability to deter and manage escalation. Uh, China needs to have the capacity to respond in kind or to respond in proportion uh, to a limited uh, uh, scale of nuclear, uh, to a limited nuclear uh, attack. Uh, I think that's why in recent years, we have seen China uh, building up its theater range nuclear forces, including DF-21, DF-26, et cetera. Um, that you know, effort to build uh, crisis management capability could further drive uh, the bilateral nuclear competition uh, because when both sides are driven by the goal to achieve escalation uh, dominance or to acquire a, a, a crisis management capabilities, that's much harder to uh, to stabilize the relationship compared with when China, at least China, was trying, you know, was satisfied with uh, a limited deterrent capability based on massive retaliation. Um, And the uh, the Taiwan situation has become uh, even more dangerous today uh, because uh, the two sides' uh, uh, positions are increasingly irreconcilable. Right? Uh, Taiwanese people, they increasingly want to preserve their freedom, their democracy, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, when they see China becoming increasingly uh, centralized, closed, and, and even authoritarian, according to international observers, uh, they have even less interest uh, to unify with the mainland. Uh, whereas China, given its stronger military power, its, its current leadership that really wants to achieve unification in order to strengthen his personal political uh, 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 heritage, um, the, the, the the resolve on the mainland becomes stronger. Uh, uh, China thinks, you know, we cannot uh, wait uh, for much longer. We have to achieve unification and therefore accomplish national rejuvenation uh, in the foreseeable future. So the positions on the two sides become increasingly irreconcilable. Uh, and that makes the risk of a military conflict uh, uh, become uh, uh, greater than before. Uh, and the fact that um, we are having uh, this uh, you know, very uh, challenging uh, predicament today across Taiwan Strait is very much because the fact that China is changing itself. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, very little domestic discussion about uh, how can we achieve peaceful unification, uh, or are there any ways to resolve this problem across the Taiwan Strait? Um, many Chinese people, including the experts uh, and including government officials, have this very firm belief that the the only legitimate way for Taiwan to become independent is through a national referendum where all the people in both the mainland and Taiwan jointly vote to allow Taiwan to become independent. That's the only you know, legitimate way for Taiwan to become independent. But I think people are not really aware 
of many other presidents in the world today that a, a region within a country is allowed to have its own referendum within its own region to determine a self, you know, to decide on their right of self-determination, right? This is the case in South Scotland, you know, where, you know, as long as Scotland itself has a referendum and the votes to become independent, then the UK would allow Scotland to become independent. And this is the case with Quebec uh, in Canada. Right? As long as the region of Quebec votes to become independent, then Canada as a country would allow it to do so. It doesn't require a national referendum uh, for a region to become independent. So there are, you know, other presidents in the world that, you know, try to resolve this problem differently. But those things are not discussed uh, or debated in China because you are not allowed to say that, you know, there are other ways to resolve the problem. You have to only believe in one option. That is, Taiwan becomes, again, part of China. And if Taiwanese people don't like it, so be it, we'll just do it coercively. We have the military power, we have the political power, we have the economic power, we can establish an embargo and eventually you have to listen to us, right? So uh, that's how the situation is become, uh, becoming really dangerous. And because the risk of a military conflict is increasing, um, nuclear issue uh, is now moved from the back burner of the US-China security relationship to the front and center. Uh, that, you know, uh, being able to uh, uh, leave nuclear weapons in the back burner of the bilateral relationship in previous decades was one important reason that US and China were able to maintain a stable nuclear relationship. But today, when the nuclear issue is moving further uh, front uh, to the stage, uh, that makes uh, nuclear escalation uh, harder to control. Um, and um, so that's you know the, the current uh, situation we are in. Uh, looking forward, uh, it would be really hard uh, to discuss arms control issues uh, between the two sides. Uh, firstly, uh, and most importantly, there is uh, no political will on the part of China. That's very clear. Uh, the, uh, there is a strong internal uh, agreement uh, in China that it is time for China to further build up its uh, strategic military capability. It's now time for China to constrain or to limit its military development. Uh, so despite American effort to try to persuade China to come to the table to talk about arms control, despite growing international pressure, on China to join arms control discussions, there is very little uh, political interest in China to do so. So that means, you know, it's really hard to start arms control, serious arms control talks anytime soon. Um, and on the American side, the US does not really understand the political driver behind China's nuclear buildup. The US is worried that the, U uh, the Chinese nuclear buildup is due to a more aggressive Chinese nuclear strategy or China, a more aggressive Chinese nuclear doctrine. They think that Chinese nuclear buildup is driven by a more ambitious military objective. And therefore, the US is also trying to uh, readjust American nuclear uh, program and a nuclear posture. You know, the recent U.S. nuclear posture review talks about the need for U.S. to deal with two peer competitors, uh, two, uh, you know, nuclear peer competitors at the same time, right? So the worry, the concern is if the U.S. is, you know, uh, fixated on the military uh, 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 level uh, and is respond and is responding at the military level by, uh, you know, uh, uh, further uh, strengthening its own nuclear uh, and other strategic capabilities, then we'll have an open day down the race. Um, another obstacle is that uh, today, uh, the Chinese uh, nuclear arsenal is still much smaller uh, than the United States. 
uh, as I said, the uh, deployed strategic uh, warheads in the United States is about uh, 1,500. Uh, there are another uh, less than 2,000 nuclear weapons in reserve. They are not actively deployed, but they are in reserve. Um, so uh, Chinese arsenal is still uh, smaller, uh, but this uh, capability asymmetry uh, makes it hard to talk about arms control because historically arms control took place between two equal or relatively equal nuclear powers. So how do you negotiate arms control treaties between a stronger and a weaker uh, power? That's something, that's a new challenge. Um, and in addition to that, Chinese officials, Chinese experts have uh, much less experience compared with their Russian American counterparts in negotiating and implementing arms control agreements. Uh, and therefore, they are not very much familiar with arms control treaties or the verification regimes, verification technologies. And they don't really trust that uh, an arms control agreement, uh, especially uh, one between a stronger power and a weaker power, can be uh, fairly negotiated and faithfully implemented. There is a strong suspicion uh, uh, in the minds of many Chinese experts that the US uh, being a much stronger and much more capable power will be able to cheat without being detected. Uh, but China you know, will have a, a less capability to, to cheat. So uh, if an agreement is negotiated, the US will secretly be able to develop uh, prohibited uh, capabilities, but China will be bound by the constraints. So that will make it uh, an, a, a disadvantage uh, for China. Uh, so all these factors uh, make arms control negotiations hard. Uh, that said, um, you know, I think you know there are still things we can do today to marginally help improve the situation. Um, you know, we can try to have a political level uh, conversation. As I said, I think the Chinese nuclear buildup is very much driven by political level level thinking. Uh, if the two sides can, uh, especially the leaderships, can sit down together and talk about their political. Uh, problems like Taiwan, like uh, domestic suppression, uh, human rights uh, issues, concerns, and try to reach some basic agreement uh, that may help uh, reduce uh, the Chinese incentive to build up its uh, nuclear capacity. Uh, at least that will make China more willing uh, to discuss uh, arms control issues. Um, and they may also be able to uh, jointly examine some of the complex building measures or arms control proposals at the ASPER level, right? The reason that China doesn't like arms control uh, is because uh, China is not convinced that arms control measures can help advance China's own security interests. Uh, China worried that arms control measures would be a trap uh, established by the, the U.S. and Western countries to undermine China's capacity to develop its legitimate military technologies. Uh, but uh, there are already a number of very interesting uh, arms uh, and very concrete arms control proposals and ideas uh, uh, made by international researchers and scholars, and those uh, proposals. Uh, will you know, benefit both sides' interests uh, in, in a relatively equal way. Uh, the thing is, China hasn't, uh, because of China's lack of interest in arms control, it has not bothered to look deeply into those existing arms control proposals. Uh, I think if somehow the experts uh, from the two sides uh, can jointly examine the technical and policy feasibility of such arms control ideas and proposals, they may be able to uh, realize that, uh, in fact, uh, you know, 
uh, such uh, measures could be beneficial to China's own security. Um, so that may help increase Chinese interest uh, in uh, considering uh, such proposals. But anyway, I think I'm, uh, you know it's already 45 minutes past the hour, so perhaps I should stop here uh, in case you have any questions or comments.